Will democracy survive in the next couple of years? And essentially we are the same. And there are so many needs that Minnesota has. What people are saying they need right now. Access to democracy is made possible by donations from the following organizations. Thomson Reuters, a global company with expertise and insight to unravel complex situations in the areas of law, tax, compliance, government, and media. Their worldwide network of journalists and editors keep customers up to speed on relevant global events. Thomson Reuters, the answer company. Crutchfield Dermatology, a full-service treatment center in Medispa in Egan. Their goal is to help you look good and feel great with beautiful skin. With service built around courtesy, dignity, and respect, Mayo-trained Dr. Charles Crutchfield personally treats each patient and is acknowledged as one of the nation's best physicians. Firefly Credit Union, with locations throughout the Twin Cities, has proudly served Minnesotans since 1925. Firefly guides its members forward by delivering customized financial solutions to improve their lives in all aspects of banking. Firefly Credit Union, they light the way with life illuminated. Edina Eye, physicians and surgeons, a division of Twin Cities Eye Consultants, has proudly served the Twin Cities for more than 55 years. Now in seven convenient locations, using the most advanced technology combined with human touch, Edina Eye offers comprehensive services but dedicated specialists committed to excellence with innovative procedures and expertise for the most advanced eye care. Welcome, Access to Democracy returns. We have two guests, two first time guests actually, although I think one of them was here years ago, but we don't even count that. Uh, but one of our guests is Julie Ethan and Julie, welcome. Our Thank other you, guest, Alan. Our other guest is well known to people in the Egan area. Uh, he, he is involved as a local activist in a bunch of things. And Ben Gross, and welcome, Ben. Hello. <clears throat> now, uh, among other things, uh, and Julie, why don't you give us a little background on you? Uh, since it's been a while since you've been with Access, uh, decades, shall we say. Okay, Alan, thank you. Um, I've been living in San Diego, and that's for the last two and a half years, but I'm originally a Minnesota native. And uh, during COVID, I was laid off from a job where we were helping uh, groups come to the border and learn more about the, the immigration crisis directly from Border Patrol, directly from groups helping uh, immigrants. And when I was laid off, I was able to pick up this book project that I had set aside in 2017, where I uh, basically tell the story of my life as a conservative and my friendship with Benjamin, who is definitely a liberal and uh, the several election cycles that took us through and how that uh, friendship uh, impacted each other's lives. And we ultimately you know, came to the conclusion that we both wanted to help people figure out how to understand their political opposite. And so that book is entitled, How Can Half the Country Be So Stupid? Yes, it is. Uh, ben is holding up a copy, and I think actually uh, uh, Avi, Avi has some copies, and he'll actually uh, put them on the screen. Now, Ben, you are uh, a Minnesotan at the moment, but you weren't always a Minnesotan, and you've had a very interesting background starting from childhood, so why don't you tell us about it a little bit? <laughs> Oh, thank you very much. And I'll try to make this brief. My father was a rock star in my life. I started in politics at three years old with going to doors, knocking on doors, asking people if they were registered to vote. And if they said yes, I said, thank you. If they said no, you know, I said, would you like to register? 
And if they said yes, I said, my father will be by in a few minutes. And I got to take a piece of chalk out to the sidewalk and make a mark as a signal that that was the place my dad would go to register. So uh, it goes from there of him uh, being instrumental with creating the first integrated planned neighborhood in this country. And uh, it, it was 90% white and they still elected him uh, mayor, first councilman and then mayor. Uh, in and those we're talking days. about California. Right. And uh, Melpitas, California. And he had a personal relationship with Walter Ruther of the UAW, which uh, sponsored uh, the neighborhood. And so uh, it's been an activist family, uh, political conventions my whole life. Well, you started a little bit earlier than that, though. Uh, I believe that uh, Nikita Khrushchev came into your life at some point. Isn't that uh, true? It's very true. Uh, what happened, and I sent Avi a link about it, was uh, Khrushchev, the kitchen cabinet debate. And it was, Nixon was going to go visit uh, Russia, well, the Soviet Union then, and called upon the nation to go down on their knees, face east, and pray for all the imprisoned uh, Soviet Union citizens that wanted to leave, okay? So anyway, the kit, you can look it up, the kitchen debate happened and my father was following it uh, because of one thing that happened. Khrushchev and Nixon face to face, uh, he was upset. Uh, Khrushchev, Nikita, that uh, Nixon had pulled the stunt about facing the East and uh, uh, approving the release. He said to Nixon that how is it any different how we treat our Jews here than how you uh, treat your Blacks in America. So that got my father's attention and ended up with an invitation uh, to Khrushchev to come visit uh, the United States and the Ford plant in Milpitas, California. So he ended up coming out and having a backyard barbecue at my house and talking with my dad and that was early on that day. So your, your activism goes way back. Uh, now, as, as far to the left as you are, and uh, Julie, I have to admit that uh, I have been accused of being uh, further to the left than Lenin. Uh, you, however, have been an ultra conservative and a conservative all your life. So uh, what brought you and Ben grows together? Well, orig originally, uh, we, we both live in Egan, Minnesota, and we both had daughters in kindergarten at Thomas Lake Elementary, and they developed a friendship and uh, wanted to start having sleepovers. So, of course, the parents got involved with each other, and eventually, we just found that we really enjoyed each other's company. And uh, it is true that it, we were very conservative at the time. And the book is sort of an evolution of my journey through, uh, through politics and, 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 and going more toward the middle and that kind of thing. But Benjamin was a really big part of that process. So was his wife, Beth. 
because uh, they were always inviting us to, to be involved or to attend events or have our children attend events. For example, my daughter um, got invited by Benjamin and Beth to the presidential elector ceremony for Barack Obama in 2008 at the Minnesota State Capitol. And that was, even though we were conservatives, we let our daughter go. And that was just one of the ways that we, you know, really co-mingled and, and, and we didn't have all these, the, the vitriol that goes on today and we weren't triggered by each other. It was very casual and friendly. Well, let me uh, talk about your book a little bit, which again, I said, uh, how can half the country be so stupid uh, is the title. And you uh, really call it a memoir and a guide to friendship between political opposites. Now you have some interesting chapters in there and we'll talk about them. Understanding liberals is one of your chapters. Uh, and it's an easy read and it's a small book. Uh, it's, you know, one, one evening reading. Uh, Understanding conservatives is another chapter, which uh, I read, but I still don't understand conservatives, I have to admit. Uh, uh, evangelicals, end time teachings. Uh, Building Bridges, George Floyd and all. Uh, so let's, uh, let's really step back and talk about how did you understand uh, liberals? How did you come to understand liberals? Well, that's an interesting question. I think my goal in the book was in some ways to help people walk in the shoes of a conservative who's going through the 2008 recession and and uh, nearly losing their business and, and, and to walk in the shoes of someone who has certain religious beliefs and may not trust the government with all their tax dollars. And so in order for me to, to help people understand liberals, um, in chapter seven, I have an interview with Kevin Fahey, which is Benjamin's father uh, or brother-in-law. And- uh, wait, say, wait, you should say best brother. And you know. Okay, yes. Yes, his, his wife, Beth's brother, and and Kevin, um, you know, had a union job on the Iron Range, and he really took me through what it felt like to to be a union activist. What did they stand for? What was it like to be a dear friend of Paul Wellstone? And so I try to tell the story from you know at least give some of that space so that my reader can experience both sides, not only walking in my shoes as a conservative, but walking in other people's shoes as liberals. And we can see that actually there's a lot of commonality. Now, Ben, I, I have to ask you, uh, because you are a better man than I am, uh, you apparently understand conservatives, uh, especially now after this Trump election, uh, I do not understand them. I do not understand how my uh, elected representatives can, uh, fortunately not in this district, can not refer to him, uh, speaking of Biden, as the president-elect. And uh, how did you come to understand conservatives better? Because I, I still grapple with it. You start by building a foundation of trust. And how you build trust is having an open discussion. But the key is don't start with things you disagree totally on. Start with things you agree on or somewhat agree on, you know, because then you can start talking about like jobs, family, community, and those are from Kevin also, uh, about those kind of issues. Uh, like when it comes to like the police, okay, and this defund the police. No, that doesn't get the dialogue going. It's too opposite. Talk about the mental health issues that the police department have to deal with. That shouldn't be their job. So all of a sudden, this, you know, uh, Black Lives Matter uh, isn't about as confrontational if you're talking about 
how can we help out the police with mental health issues, which is a lot of their calls. Or uh, one other point is on the police, because that's so hot about defunding the police and all that is I try to get people to talk about sexual assaults by police officers and what happens then. And they're blown away how uh, investigations get terminated if a police officer resigns. Then he can go and repeat the same offense at another uh, police department. There's no tracking. So it, find subjects that you can talk about and not have the intensity of wanting to ram your heads together. And I see Julie agreeing with you on that. Yeah. So let's, let's hear from her on it. Well, that is exactly what Benjamin did the first time we ever talked about politics is he started the conversation by saying, do you think there is anything the two of us could agree on in politics? And that, that started almost a, you know, a, a, a two decade conversation. And we found that we did have some agreement surrounding immigration and that the system was broken. I was a small employer trying to compete against other employers that were using um, undocumented workers and, and abusing the wage situation in that case. And I, I felt like something needed to be done about immigration and so did Benjamin. And so we, we had some common ground and, and, and that is, you know, he just put it beautifully. You don't start with the most contentious thing. You basically ask what, what are some things we might agree on and, and maybe explore that. And you are doing that, I take it, or you have been doing that in California, uh, having moved from Egan several years ago uh, as trying to work with undocumented immigrants and immigrants in general. Is that correct? Yeah. Absolutely. I've always been drawn to that. And once I, um, through Benjamin, you know, I was invited to one of the Martin Luther King breakfasts and I got to hear Senator Cory uh, Booker speak uh, back when he was, I think, the mayor of Newark, New Jersey. And, and that made me so curious. So I started digging into who is this servant leader type person who would go and live among the poor and, and lead in that way. And those are the kinds of things that got me uh, wanting to learn more about immigration and, and who was really to blame for this. And, and it's interesting that the more I looked into it, the more I realized, you know, um, we always focus on the immigrant instead of the broader environment that has created this, uh, this push for them to come here. And, and, and so I started to look at issues a little bit more um, globally, environmentally, rather than just focusing on like this law and order, this, you know, situation with one individual person. And, uh, and that's been really, well, it's helped broaden my worldview to say the least. Now, Benjamin, I, I know that you are- One point, Julian. Okay. Um, the key word that triggered uh, the discussion and the journey about uh, immigration and Julie was, Julie, I don't see them as illegal aliens. I see them as... Economic refugees. Thank you. And I was like, what? What, what does that mean, economic refugee? And I, I had never thought about what was going on on their side of the border and why they might wanna leave you know, Benjamin said, why would they want to leave their family, their language, their culture? Don't you think there's something going on there? And it really made me think. And, and they're fleeing for their lives in many cases uh, through no fault of their own. Uh, just the really, uh, the, the area that they live in, the country that they live in is going through chaos and revolution. And uh, they are victimized for no reason at all. So that uh, uh, economic uh, refugees is probably a, a very good phrase. And 
that started it with the two of you, I take it. Yes, and, and you know, that was, in a sense, that was framing. And what I've learned is when you can reframe issues, uh, you- it, can, it can have a lot more pull. And uh, I actually started helping, you know, small campaigns with their messaging because the, you know, the way you frame something uh, sometimes you can get to the heart of another person quicker than going through any amount of, you know, facts and logic to try to convince them. Now, Ben, I know that uh, you have been very, very uh, active and outspoken in the community and very active uh, in so many respects. Now, the pandemic uh, has actually had to impede you in that regard. Uh, also some health issues. So how are you doing in that regard and how are you dealing with the pandemic in terms of your activism? Okay, first of all, I I wanna give a big shout out here for the Mayo Clinic. We have one of the best hospitals in the world. And I feel I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for them. Because 13 years ago, I was misdiagnosed uh, with uh, uh, throat cancer. And it was inoperable by the doctors here. I asked my doctor, if this happened to you, your wife, your kids, what would you do? And my doctor answered, I would go to the mail and see Dr. Olson, who is uh, ENT and what? It's, it was just a whole thing. Well, I got there, they decided that uh, it was inoperable uh, that there was nothing they could do. And this was 13 years ago? 13 years ago. Because but- I, I've, had, I've had my own wonderful experience with the Mayo, which we've talked about on this program uh, quite a few times. And uh, I can't say enough about them either. And honestly, that's one of the injustices that we have in this country. I'm alive because of the union, the UAW, my medical health care, you know, paid for that. My first three days there were $280,000. And I had to pay $223 out of my pocket. So uh, I got off on that. That was one part of the health issue. But uh, the second I don't, part, I don't want to cut you short, but we're down to five minutes. So uh, how are you doing today and how has the pandemic uh, affected you in terms of cutting down your activism? Well, it hasn't cut it down, but it has lessened my hope in a lot of ways because Oh, back to this thing about talking, you know, this whole debate about the math. You know, what I'm changing it to, I asked people about, well, you know, for years we grew up with no shirt, no shoes signs to go into a restaurant. Why weren't people in the streets writing about that? What is the difference between no shirts and no shoes and a mask? So that's how I reach out to the other side and make them think. And Julie, uh, what's the difference between your life in California in terms of activism and your life here? And uh, I do want to spend uh, at least a moment or two on your chapter, Evangelicals, End Time Teachings, and how that uh, plays into your life, or does it? Well, I mean, honestly, to answer the latter question, no, I'm no longer an evangelical. Um, 
I've, you know, I've come through quite an evolution going back to school. Um, five years ago, I, I went to San Diego for a year on a scholarship to get my master's degree in peace and justice. And that sort of opened my eyes to um, kind of the global uh, situation that causes conflict where, you know, so much is economic security and food security. And these are the, the scarcity is what causes people to to fight against each other and to create wars. And so I definitely am not the same person I was, um, you know, 20 years ago when we had kindergartners. Um, so in, you know, in San Diego, we are, we are empty nesters finally. So I've been able to focus on, um, uh, you know, like I said, the, the border, the immigrant situation, and then my writing. So I don't know if that, so ask away about evangelicals though, Al, <laughs> Alan. Well. Uh, where do they fit in our society today? Uh, we have evangelicals uh, who are people who put themselves next to God, and yet they were wholeheartedly supporting Donald Trump, who, in my estimation, is as far from God as, as a human being can get. Uh, how do you reconcile that? Well, you know, without going into a long theological discussion, they have they have made their own bridges between uh, justifying support for someone who may not exactly hold their same beliefs. Um, but I can tell you in terms of hope, especially like the organization I was working for, the Global Immersion Project, they were reaching out to churches and evangelicals, and they were trying to educate them through, through immersion trips on um, on seeing things a little differently and seeing things, uh, sometimes you just have to experience it for yourself. I mean, my favorite uh, line from an immigration attorney was that people are, you know, might totally be against uh, undocumented immigrants until their son or daughter falls in love with one. And then all of a sudden that personal experience changes things. I think it's the same for, for evangelicals, just slowly, you know, one by one, some, experiences. I think um, you can say the same thing about religion. Uh, people who are steeped in their religion and then a member of their family. Uh, and we can say the same thing about racism also in terms of blacks or whites or Latinos. And we're seeing it. I, I, I firmly believe that 50 years from now, uh, our country is going to look entirely different uh, we are not going to be the white country that we are now. And I think we'll, we will be the better for it as we have an amalgam of all peoples. Uh, and hopefully someplace along the line, the prejudice can, can dissipate so that we don't have these groups running around that are just bigoted, really bullies. And uh, anyway, uh, this is your interview, not mine. So uh, uh, I couldn't resist. I'm going to have to cut it short at that point. Uh, I want to thank Benjamin Gross. I want to thank uh, Julie Ethan. Uh, we really didn't get a chance to really, really talk about your background and book, uh, but we will at some point in the future. And uh, this has been Access to Democracy, a very interesting and different discussion. Thank you both for joining with us. and. Uh, Thanks again. We'll see you in the future. Thank you, Alan. Thank you.